Hey everyone, this is Alexa back with Lexington Public Library's podcast, our Checked Out podcast. Um, today we are going to be talking about Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad. Before we get into that, um, I just want to do some quick housekeeping. Um, it does still help us out tremendously if you guys listen and subscribe if you like the podcast on iTunes. That way it gives us kind of a ballpark range of who all is listening and enjoying it with us. Um, And then another quick thing is that we are going to start a new program series uh, where we have programs that tie into our podcasts. So the first one in the series will be the Underground Railroad, and the program to go along with that will be at the Beaumont Branch on Tuesday, April 18th at 7 p.m. We are going to be joined by Amanda Higgins from the Kentucky Historical Society. She is going to be talking about fact and fiction in Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad and how history influenced Whitehead, specifically uh, black women in Kentucky who participated in and were a part of the Underground Railroad, um, the real Underground Railroad. <laughs> so today it is me and I'm joined by Ashley. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself really quickly. Hi everyone, I am Ashley McGraw. I, I'm a library assistant at the central location downtown and just happy to join you today. Yeah, so uh, jumping right in, um, our read this month was The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, as I said, um, and that is a alternative history fiction novel. Um, So it is set during slavery in America. Um, However, the Underground Railroad, as we know it in this book, has been portrayed as an actual physical railroad. Um, So this novel follows Cora, who is a young slave. I believe she is 16, 15 or 16. Um, And she is approached by another slave, Caesar, on the plantation where she lives. Um, and he basically thinks of her as a good luck charm because her mother is one of the only slaves who's ever successfully gotten away. Um, and so he wants Cora to run away with him. Um, Mm -hmm. and so that's where it kind of starts. Yeah. Um, initially though, she doesn't want to run away because her grandmother had told her that there was no point in running. And so that really kind of been instilled in her, but then there's an incident on the plantation where she's severely beaten Mm -hmm. and so she realizes realizes that it's better to just go ahead and run what does she have to lose right yeah this is i mean whenever we say that this book is about slavery i mean colson whitehead does not shy away from any sort of the atrocities that that happened during slavery cora cora does not live on a kind of margaret mitchell-esque plantation um it's horrifying (laughs) it's absolutely horrifying um the some of the early atrocities that are kind of portrayed as happening to the slaves on the plantation are just absolutely nightmarish. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of get a taste of what kind of awaits Cora if she does run. Um, there is one character who runs away and is caught, um, and he is just absolutely tortured, killed. Mm-hmm. Um, he's burned alive, right? He is burned alive. Yeah. His genitals are cut off and sewn into his mouth, and he is burned alive. Right. Um, so if you're listening and you were on the fence about whether or not you wanted to read this book... Um, it is, it's very gory. I mean, really, I, it's one of those books where I read it and I immediately said, if this is ever adapted into a movie or a TV series, which I believe it is, I, I would not be able to watch it. I, I, I mean, it, it's pretty violent. Yeah. I mean, I would watch it, but yeah, it is, it's, it's really, it's really hard to deal with and know that these types of things probably did happen to slaves. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that's the worst thing about it is is not only is it violence, you know that it's it's factual violence. Right. This sort of thing really did occur. Yeah. Um, and that that's just what it made it doubly hard to hard to read. I know you said you listened to the audiobook. I did. I listened partly to the audiobook and I read it. Um, and it's a really good actor that does mm-hmm. the voices and um, she gives a good sense of Cora. It's nice to hear Cora's voice because she does narrate so much of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the only chapters that aren't narrated by her, we get a few cutaway chapters of side characters throughout the book yeah. um, to kind of give their perspective, um, usually when they're about to pass away. Um, is nice. <laughs> one of the things that I mentioned before. I had kind of, uh, it was just, I mean, this book is, it's a wonderfully written book. It's essential reading as far as I'm concerned. It was it was a great book to read. I would never read it again. And it was it was just heartbreaking. I mean, there, there are so many characters 
who are side characters and you think, oh yeah, well, whatever. And then this thing happens to them. And then the next chapter, inevitably, Colson Whitehead will put you inside of their head right. and immediately humanize them for you. And I mean, no, nobody really escapes in this book. No. Um, there's, there's the one couple, um, Ethel, who Cora ends up staying in, Ethel and her husband's attic for a few months. Um, and the whole time Cora is there, Ethel is very standoffish. She's kind of cagey because, I mean, her husband is a member of the Underground Railroad. Right. Him allowing Cora to stay in their house puts her at severe risk, as you see. Yeah. Um, the town that they live in has a minstrel show every Saturday night where they they do all these fun performances <laughs> and have right. a great time and everyone yeah. loves it. And it ends with them having found a slave who they then lynch right outside yeah. of Ethel's home. Right. Um, so, I mean, you kind of understand why Ethel might not be too keen on helping out Cora. Um, and, I mean, whenever it, it comes to pass that, again, this is not a spoiler-free <laughs> podcast. Spoilers yeah. abound here. Um, big spoiler coming up. Uh and eventually, Cora is found in Ethel's and her husband's home, and Ethel and her husband are taken outside, and, and then they are lynched yeah. um, outside of their own house um, while Cora manages to escape again. Um, and then the immediately following that, um, you're taken kind of back into Ethel's past, and you find that um, she she yeah. is probably a closeted lesbian. Right. Um, yeah. She had kind of an infatuation with one of her house slaves when she was a child. Right. That her father was having an affair with? That her father also was having an affair right. with. So Ethel had a really complicated childhood. <laughs> really, really difficult relationships right. kind of tangled up in there. And she even does start warming up to Cora um, in the yeah. last little bit that Cora's in her house. Cora gets sick and Ethel takes her down into her bedroom and kind of tends to her. Yeah. And, and you can tell that Ethel still is kind of working through some stuff. Yeah, and still, I mean, I don't... I had a hard time being sympathetic with her. Really? Because it still seemed like she was only doing it because she felt like it was her Christian duty. Yeah. And so it yeah. still was... She She still had a hard time, I feel like, seeing Cora as a person. I think so, too, um, yeah. And so I, I really didn't like that character. And the only reason that they took in Cora to begin with was because... They got to that station of the Underground Railroad, mm-hmm. and it was closed, essentially. Right, And yeah. so Martin, is that his name? I be- yeah, yeah, Martin, Martin and Ethel. He, um, he, he was doing it, but it was only because his father had been a part of the Underground Railroad. It was, really wasn't something that he wanted to do, but he felt like he had to because his dad had done it. Yeah, I think that Martin and Ethel, they were, I mean, I think they were definitely some of the least sympathetic, like, helpful characters right. in the book. Because it was, I mean, you're right, yeah, Martin got to the to the Underground Railroad stop, and it was like he had just gone down there to just, like, check it. He had no idea Cora was there. Cora had kind of collapsed down there because she'd just been waiting and waiting for somebody to come and find her. Um, And he took her in, but he did not want to because, again, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I think the only reason he took her in is because black people weren't allowed in North Carolina. And so for him to be seen with her, there's nothing he could do with her other than hide her away, I guess, other than kill her. Yeah, Um, and, yeah. So, I mean, it's... You know, there's more than one side to every story, but it was yeah. that was also Cora was able to read. She likes to read, mm-hmm. and so she's able to read the almanacs, and he leaves like old almanacs mm-hmm. for her. Um, but she was just in this little attic and only had a little bit of light, and she would look out at the town square and see people being lynched and see them doing these minstrel shows, and it was just. It was really horrible. Yeah. I, you mentioned, uh, I think it was something that you said you read where it was like, um, on the plantation, whenever Cora was a slave, she ha- she was forced to watch right. the lynchings and the torture and the beatings and everything happen. Um, but when she was in the attic at Martin and Ethel's house, she had the ability there to look away. Right. So, um, yeah. And I th- I hadn't really thought about that whenever I was reading it. And yeah. I think that's really, that's one of the things that Colson Whitehead does really well, I think. Yeah. Um, is he, he creates parallels and he creates symbolism um, in, in ways that you don't immediately notice on your first reading. Right, yeah. Definitely so. Um, which I really appreciate about his writing. Um, I, this was actually the first book that I read by Colson Whitehead. Um, yeah. But I think I should read more. Yeah, I didn't know anything about him um, mm-hmm. until this this book had so much buzz, and so I wanted to read it. And then, of course, it, Oprah endorsed it. Yes. <laughs> so, Therefore, yes. everyone read so it. It must be wonderful. But exactly. He's written um, many books. Mm-hmm. I think he's even written a zombie book. So he's got... Yeah, I'd heard that. Sag Harbor was the is the one that I always see going in and out at the library, and I always right. think, oh, Sag Harbor, Colson Whitehead. I know nothing about that. Um, 
But I, I was reading an interview with him where he he mentioned where he he's one of those writers where it's like he's a consistent novelist. He puts out all these novels. Some people read them more often than not. Not that many people right. read them. And so whenever this book happened and Oprah endorsed it, it was kind of like, okay, like right. this is a thing now. Yeah. Um, people are paying attention to me, which I always think is kind of cool when that happens to authors. Yeah. It's like he's just been consistently putting out his work over the years and f- gotten some recognition for this right, one, yeah. <laughs> which it's well-deserved. I mean, like, as I said, it's, it's a horrifying book, but it's a beautifully written book. Right. Um, he's, he's definitely a wonderful writer. Um, so do we want to talk a little bit about our main antagonist of the novel? Oh, well, I mean, is the main antagonist Ridgeway or <laughs> Randall? I mean, I guess Ridgeway is really the main antagonist. Yeah. I mean, Randall, it kind of fades away, I feel, right. because even after a certain point, like, Ridgeway isn't really even hired by Randall anymore. He's, like, right. he's pursuing Cora for his own, right. his own pride after a certain point in the book. Yeah, because he's never, he's always found the slaves that run away, mm-hmm. and so he never found Mabel, Cora's mother, so he's determined to find Cora because she's the daughter of Mabel, and so it's just, like, his life's mission mm-hmm. to make sure he returns her, um home to the Randall Plantation, home, in quotes. Right, exactly. (laughs) Big quotations there on home. Uh, Randall considers it her home. Right. Um, Yeah, and so Ridgeway is, I I refer to him as Javert. Um, He's kind of this just single-minded character who was hired by Randall, who was Cora's owner, um, to find her whenever she and Caesar escape initially. Um, And just over the book, he just keeps popping up, and he's just relentless. I mean, he shows up everywhere, and at one point, he shows up um, after Cora, and he has with him Homer. Homer. um, (laughs) Who is, I would venture to say, one of the most interesting characters in the book. Yeah. Um, Definitely one of the saddest. Um, he's, He's a little black boy who... Ridgeway purchased as a slave and then freed, mm-hmm. but Homer stays with him, and he kind of has his little ledger, and he keeps notes for Ridgeway, and he helps him out in his slave-catching enterprise. Right. Um, and, yeah, I, I had some thoughts about Homer. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, Homer is just, it's just sad. He's yeah. this little African-American boy, and he was freed, but he feels like the only, the safest place for him to be is with Ridgeway. Right. Because he says that if he was freed, then somebody would probably enslave him again. Um, and he's a child and he can't live on his own. So he's just like Ridgeway's little minion. And it's, yeah. and he helps capture people and he mm-hmm. helps capture Cora. And it's just, it's just sad because you're like, you wonder what, what are his options? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the Ridgeway's other kind of henchman that he has is this guy who wears a necklace of human ears. Yes. So that's the other sort of company that Homer gets to keep in this book. Um, yeah. Kind of, kind of adds another layer of just. Yeah, I mean, I think that what the guy with the ears is Bozeman, mm-hmm. and then there's a scene. So basically, Cora is Cora and Caesar are in North Carolina, um, at the at the ideal town, Mm -hmm. which we haven't talked about that yet. But Ridgeway comes and finds her, and so she runs. Um, And so that's when she's with Ridgeway and Homer. And then Jasper is another guy that they they pick up along the way, and he sings in order to kind of get through the pain of being captured, and then they just blow his head off, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's that's about as eloquently as I think it's put in the book. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like, we want him to stop singing. And so, I mean, it's just people's lives, black lives have no value in this world. Yeah. Um, in, In that, you know, in the world of Colson Whitehead and we could bring that along to today, but we'll just yeah. focus, on, <laughs> focus um, on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's absolutely heartbreaking, because, I mean, he he keeps Homer with him, and it's, I mean, it's just so strange seeing Ridgeway's relationship with this character, because, I mean, he's he's capturing these slaves, and, as you said, they, they just murder Jasper because yeah. he was singing, and it's like... What what is that doing to this little boy's right. psyche? Just seeing people like him who are just so disposable to right. the guy that he hangs out with. But he, it's like he separated himself from, yeah. from the other um, slaves, and it's he and Ridgeway have this like paternal relationship. It's so bizarre, and it's just 
it's just odd. And he even, so much so that he shackles himself to the wagon every mm-hmm. night whenever they go and, um, you know, set up camp for the night. Just like as a show of like loyalty, yeah. I guess. Yeah, or that if someone came along, they would think that he was a slave. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or that he just feels comfortable that way. That's No, I think that they talk about that. That's the only way he can sleep, right? Because he feels comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah he feels safe. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, just, it's, yeah, it's real <laughs> creepy. Real creepy. Um um, and yeah, you mentioned um, the 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 so called perfect town, and so we kind of skipped over that. I started yeah. talking about Ethel, um, who was in North Carolina, and so South Carolina is where Cora and Caesar initially end up whenever they escape from the Randall plantation. And there's kind of a time jump, and you're intru- you're kind of reintroduced to Cora as Bessie. As Bessie, um, and Caesar has taken the name Christian in this in this town in South Carolina, and so. Um, Cora is living, I'll refer to her as Cora, even though she goes by Bessie at this point. Um, It could get confusing real quick. Yeah, Um, and you initially are like, who is Bessie? Who's Bessie? Why am I being introduced to this person? Is this somebody else that I have to worry about now? I don't think I can take that. Right. Um, And so, yeah, she's she's living under an assumed identity in South Carolina because Cora obviously is her name, uh, the the name of the fugitive slave, so she has to assume a new identity. Yeah. Yeah. Because she, when they were on the run... They, so when they were trying to get to... The they were initially trying to get to the first stop in the Underground Railroad, and a third slave had kind of seen them leaving and had taken off after Caesar, Caesar and Cora. Yeah. Um, and Caesar and Cora initially get um, attacked right. by three, I think it was three or four white like, men. Yeah. Um, who had, who, they'd initially, been, they'd already been alerted, basically, right. that slaves had escaped from Randall's plantation. And so they were attacked... Um, and Cora ended up inadvertently killing a white man, who she later found out was a pretty young white boy. Yeah, it was, yeah. She thought it was a man at the time. Right. And then whenever she heard about it in the news later, um, it turned out it was like a 14-year-old kid yeah. or something like that, yeah. which she she had the decency to feel bad about, right. which honestly she didn't need to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just like, I mean, she but, was fighting for her life. Right. I mean, but it kind of shows that even when you're treated like nothing, yeah. you're treated less than... Less, less than human, mm-hmm. you still are. And even though people are doing this to you, you still question yourself for that I did that. I took someone's life. It was so. amazing that Cora was, it, I mean, she she had so much humanity yeah. still, even after all that she had been subjected to at that point. Yeah. Um, at 16 years old on that plantation. Right. Um, and the character that followed them, Lovey, mm-hmm. she is captured. She and is. I think later we find out that she was taken back and killed. And Yeah. Don't they have, like, a row of the people they, they kill? And it's, like, just so you can see, so everyone can see what happened to them? I believe that's at North Carolina, yeah. Okay. where Where it's, like, outside of the town, like, oh, leading up okay. to it. Whenever Martin's bringing her into town, he, yeah. like, has her look at it. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that right? Yeah. That's true. Um, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it were in other locations as well. Yeah. I just, um, I thought that there was something on the plantation, but... It's cause, possible, Because I'm picturing yeah. the guy who had his genitals cut off and was roasted i don't know anyway maybe so so. yeah Yeah. but getting the reason that there's an award out for her and she's a fugitive is because she well they ran away and she killed this right so she's like extra wanted yes um it would it would really really be good for ridgeway if he could find her and return her to randall yeah um so that that is that does kind of add an extra layer of urgency Mm -hmm. to to her capture yeah um, but yeah, so they end up in South Carolina in this town, and they have these assumed identities. Um, Cora is staying in kind of a boarding house for for African American women, mm-hmm. um, and she has a job. She has a nanny and a housekeeper um, for a local white family, and she really likes her job. Um, yeah. The kids the kids are nice to her. She gets to go to the store, and like she has all this freedom. She gets to kind of do her own stuff and come back and right. read and learn. Um, she's learning to write and to read. Right. Um, Caesar is working in a factory. Um, they get to go to these like lovely little afternoons in the park together, and it seems really idyllic. Yes. Um, which is why it's just another <laughs> like kick. <laughs> right. Um, when you find out that the town is basically using these African American citizens as as a eugenics experiment. Right. Um, they, they're going and getting these free doctor physicals and the doctor is highly suggesting that sterilization right. would be a really good option yeah. for them health wise. Yeah. Um, and then the one woman, did they take her child? Is that why she was, cause she's hysterical 
And they, they say that it's because they give some false reason for her. Mm-hmm. Like, she comes and interrupts a party that they're allowed to have. Right. Like, once a month, they're allowed to have a party on the square. And she breaks in, and she's screaming about her child. And uh, Yeah, it. I was a little confused about that at first, too. I kind of took it to mean that... They, they took away her her possibility of okay. having children, okay. they, that they did sterilize her. Yeah. Because um, they took my children, they took my children. And, and I think... Okay. Yeah, and, right. and I think that that was when Cora kind of put it together. Right. Um, because she did have that meeting with the doctor where he was like, well, maybe you should consider it. And he was kind of presenting it as like, oh, well, you can choose. Just think yeah. about it. Think about it really hard <laughs> and then get back to me. Right. Um, and so I think that whenever Cora saw that hysterical woman, she kind of realized then that Something's mm, off. it wasn't necessarily voluntarily. Right. And um, if she didn't make a decision soon, the decision probably would have ended up being made for her. Right. Um, and so, and then to add another layer to her stay in South Carolina, there was then, um, she gets reassigned. Right. Um, so her, her boarding house, uh, like matron, like supervisor, I don't know, there's like a white lady in charge of the boarding house, basically, who kind of is in charge of placing all of the the African-American women in jobs. And she's like, oh, well, you're going to get reassigned. It's this great new job. And it's, it's because you're doing so well at your, at your job now. And it turns out she's being hired at a new museum exhibit. Yes. Um, which is showing the black American experience. Yeah. I'm doing air quotes right now. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, it was the black American it's experience, but it's... The highly sanitized version. Bizarre, yeah. yeah. It's, and so it's like in, in Darkest Africa is the first one, yeah. and then it's aboard the slave ship and then on the plantation. Yeah. So it's these three kind of... Um, like set pieces yes. where they they have so whenever of course first hired by the museum she thinks she's going to be cleaning yeah which would have been way better <laughs> way better than than what they yeah. actually had in store for her and her two her two coworkers mm-hmm. um so basically they're just living mannequins yeah um, and they, it's you know they're behind the glass and people come in and are they behind glass? They are, yeah. Okay. Because she makes, yes. like, allusions to, like, all of the kids, like, pressing their face right. up against the glass. And, um, and just watching them reenact these scenes. And I remember particularly for the slavery aspect, they're, like, spinning cotton. They're spinning cotton on a wheel outside. Yeah. And Cora, and there's a part where Cora's <laughs> even like, we never did that. That's no. not a thing. And he's just like, well, yeah, usually you would have been inside when you were spinning cotton. But, you know, for, for the yeah. display. And it's just like, all right. Yeah, that that part was also very disturbing. And yeah. There's just, yeah, the whole, and the whole people watching them behind the glass for their entertainment mm-hmm. was just, Unsettling. It was one of the, honestly, it was one of the more disturbing parts of the novel for me because it was just, she was so excited to have gotten this promotion and she gets there and she's like, all right, well, where do you want me to start cleaning? And it's just, she'd been misled and it's just, it was so gross. It was just really. You know, the really, what was going on in that town because her and Caesar, there's multiple town times that they could have caught the train or the Underground Railroad to go north, but they decided to stay there because they liked it so much. Right, right. Um, they just kept putting it off, and right. we'll go next time, and maybe next time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I guess we should talk a little bit about the Underground Railroad itself. Um, whenever I picked up this book, I was kind of expecting, like, an actual train. I yeah. didn't really know what to expect. I knew yeah. that it was magic realism. I knew that it was going to be kind of taking liberties with history. Um, I thought it was really fascinating the way that he chose to portray the railroad because it's just like, who knows what you're going to get? Yeah. Like you go down into these stations and sometimes it's just like a guy on a push cart. Right. And sometimes it's like an engine with like one open bed thing attached yeah. to it. And it's just like, you don't know where they're going and you just kind of, do you want to get on? Like you'll go somewhere. Yeah. Who knows? Right. Um, it's really fascinating to me. I really enjoy thinking about kind of the logistics of it. Yeah. Like how do those tracks work? Yeah. <laughs> like, and yeah, who, and like, so, so then it comes to the people who are building these stations <laughs> um, underneath their homes and taking on that risk. And so it is nice that they're, there are white people in this book that are willing to help yeah. the black people and risk their lives for it because they they see that this is not okay and they don't they don't want to keep perpetuating slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I found the yeah the underground railroad part. I find it hard to visualize it still. I did too. Yeah, because yeah, I don't know. 
Because you, st- you want to think of it as a train, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, but it's not. It's really yeah, not. Like, it's sometimes I guess it kind of is, but then it's not, and then it's, this one's crumbled in, and this one's, like, caved in, and you can't yeah. get out, and it's, like, it's just in, in such a state of disrepair, it right. seems. And it's just, I don't know how long it's been operating. I just had a lot of questions yeah. in general about the Underground Railroad, which, I mean, it makes sense that they weren't answered because there's nobody really to answer them. <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, it's it's manned by this series of variously willing volunteers, mm-hmm. some of whom want nothing to do with it, it seems. Yeah. Like, they're, they're just doing it out of kind of this misplaced sense of duty that they have to their own relations. Right. Um, and, well, not necessarily misplaced, but they, they feel that it's misplaced. Right. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's just, it was, it's a fascinating concept. Yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I had trouble visualizing it as well. I still do. Yeah, yeah, me too. I... Yeah, that's just pretty much. What else can you say about that? I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like it's the it's the central conceit of the book, um, and I think that it was well executed. I think that it's kept vague on purpose. Mm-hmm. I think that he was deliberately kind of iffy about describing it. Yeah. Um, because I mean, that's how, that's how it would have been if if yeah. the underground Railroad really were a series of railroads yeah. like that. You, and you wouldn't have known about right. it. Right. And what a risk you'd be taking. To yeah. To run away to this underground railroad, and you you get on this contraption, and you have no idea where it's going. Who's going to be at the other end? Right. Um, people, you know, when they first got on, they they could have been lied to. There could be somebody waiting to kill them at the other end. So yeah, it's yeah. And so there's the the last place that um, that Cora ends up uh, once she leaves North Carolina. Once she leaves the attic, um, she ends up on. Uh, John Valentine's farm mm-hmm. um, in Indiana, which we were talking a little bit about um, before we began recording the podcast. Um, so basically, I, I have trouble kind of describing the farm. It's it's kind of confusing to me still. I yeah, I do. I have a hard time too. But from before when we were discussing yeah. it, so it was. I guess it's a farm mm-hmm. that's created by freed slaves. But the only reason they can have it is because they have a patronage from a white person. I believe that that is correct. Um, okay. We we Jenny was here. <laughs> yes. um, our our co-host Jenny was here at the beginning, and we were chatting about the book. She had to leave. Yeah. Um, she has a Civil War historian husband who was very helpful <laughs> to Jenny right. um, yes. for fact checking and helping her understand things in the book. Right. Ashley and I do not have a Civil War history no. uh, husband, so <laughs> we just kind of muddled through right. <laughs> as best we could. Yeah. Um, so so Cora kind of ends up on this this idyllic sort of situation. I mean, yeah. as, as close as idyllic as Cora's going to get, basically. Yeah. Um, and I guess before we, we kind of delve into the end of the book, um, we should we should go in. So throughout the book, Cora meets this kind of myriad of compatriots, mm-hmm. and they kind of fall away. You pretty much are only following Cora because she, she ends up leaving Caesar mm-hmm. in uh, South Carolina when she has to leave because... I mean, yeah. basically, just all hell breaks. Yeah, loose. Ridgeway is on her. Ridgeway is on the trail. He's there. She has to. She yeah. has to either get on the train or stay and look yeah. for Caesar. So obviously, she chooses get on the right. train. Um, that's that's her, her only shot. Um, and it turns out Caesar was lynched in South Carolina and killed. Yeah. Um, and so the whole reason that Cora initially left the plantation was because Caesar thought that she was good luck because her mother was the only successful escapee slave. Turns out we are this is going back to that thing I love so much about Colson Whitehead where you think you think you know something and then he's like jokes on yeah. you and takes you into that person's head and so we get to experience Cora's mother's escape attempt. Yes. Um and it is just heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking because most throughout the whole no- novel Cora is so upset with her mother Mabel for leaving her and she just can't imagine like how you could escape but not take your child with you because Cora was really young. Yeah, right? she was like four or five or something. Yeah, she was she and she was sleeping with her mom. Yeah, she had gone to sleep with her mother and then she woke up and her mother was gone. Right. Um, so, so that was the last. She, her mother never said goodbye or anything. Yeah. So it's just like my mom didn't love me enough to stay with me or take mm-hmm. me with her, and so and then yeah. So we find out that Mabel is actually bitten by a snake. 
Um, so, so she's she's fleeing, and then she decides, no, I can't leave. She's a change Cora. of heart. Yeah. And she's like, I need to go back to get her. But on her way, she was bitten by a poisonous snake, and she dies <gasps> in the swamp. Like I'm gonna get choked <laughs> up even thinking about it. It was so yeah. upsetting. I was just like, really? Yes. <laughs> It's so she didn't make it, and yeah. she actually did love Cora, but Cora will never know that. Yeah, and, you know Ridgeway, his passion for Cora is because her mother got away. Yeah, but she didn't get away. Um, she, she, yeah, she's in the swamp, like yeah. ten feet away off of the Randall plant. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, and I, I was talking about this a little bit before uh, we started recording the podcast too. Uh, how. Um, the fact that he has taken so many liberties with history and how the he has employed this magic realism, it kind of heightens just how grotesque and how horrifying the actual... I mean, who's to say if that exact situation played out? Right. But I would be shocked if something similar hadn't. True. I yeah. mean, it's it's too plausible that that didn't happen yeah. to someone. Right. I mean, you, yeah. Absolutely. And it's just like... It, it's just horrifying i mean i feel like i've said horrifying so many times already but i mean really yeah, no really that is that is the only word that really comes to mind when i think of some of the things that colson whitehead wrote about in this book and yeah. i know that he researched and i know that yeah that these things were real right yeah the um, other thing i would want to say about cora is just how alone she really was because her grandmother had passed away her mom you know left and died and so she's just this kid on the plantation and nobody likes her. Even the other slaves kind of, like, push her away. She kind of has to live in, like, this sad house. Of for the crazy women. Of the crazy women that yeah. nobody wants to hang out with. Yeah, and she's gang-raped by sl- the slave master? Yeah. Yeah, by by a bunch of different people. Yeah, so she's, like, like, so she's, you know, they don't, thankfully, they don't really ever go into that, into detail. Right, it's very vague. Yeah. But because it happened when, I mean, Cora's 16 when yeah. the events of this novel happened, so she was very young yeah. when that happened. So that's her only knowledge of of love between a man and a woman or yeah. any type of romantic love. So she's very distrusting of men, um, distrusting of Caesar, I think, at the beginning. Right, because when they, when they went to South Carolina, it seemed like Caesar was kind of like, he kind of wanted to maybe like, yeah. maybe like go on a date with Cora. Because yeah. it was this nice town where right. you could do that, yeah. uh, they thought. And, and Cora kind of rebuffs him a couple of times, and he finally gives up and starts kind of courting this other girl. And it yeah. really hurt Cora's feelings. Yeah, it did. Um, but she didn't know how to interact with him. Yeah. She has no basis for a healthy relationship. No. Between anyone, really. No, she doesn't. Um, I mean, her only relationship with, was with her mom. And right. she hates her mom at this point because she thinks her mom abandoned her. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, she's just... And, and that's why I was... I mentioned that I think it's so amazing and so surprising, almost, that, that Cora is able to retain that humanity and, mm-hmm. and feel guilt when she, she learns that she killed that boy. Yeah. Because, I mean, she, she's been dealt quite a hand. Right. Um, she's, she's had an absolutely heartbreaking upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, she does eventually, when, so before she gets to the farm in Indiana, mm-hmm. she, while, she, while Ridgeway has her... She meets, she escapes from Ridgeway. That's how she gets to Indiana. Right. Uh, so these two guys see that Ridgeway has gone after her, and they yeah. come, these two African American men, um, and one of them is named Royal, mm-hmm. and he's this handsome man with glasses. And um, he comes and he kind of springs her from Ridgeway's yeah. custody. Um, right. They do not kill Ridgeway. No. And they, do they? They, like, knock him out and leave him there. Yeah. They, like, time to a tree, I think. Yeah. And Homer escapes. Right. I knew that there was something with Homer. Yeah. Homer um, Homer runs away. They knock out Ridgeway, tie him to a tree, don't, don't kill him. Yeah. And then Royal then, and his buddy and um, Cora run yeah. away. And they take her to the plantation in Indiana. Right. Which is run by all ex-slaves, slaves who's, who've run away. Right. Um... They just kind of live there and do their own thing and mm-hmm. farm their own land. Yeah, they have their their white patron who yeah. allows them to kind of do their own do their own farming and planting, and they have their own homes and lives. Yeah. And so it's like they're still kind of answering to somebody, but yeah. there, there's a semblance of independence mm-hmm. that they can that they can enjoy at this place, yeah. um, which which Jenny said was historically accurate. Was that yeah, um, African Americans could have. Um, their own farms and stuff, as, so long as they did have that white patron. Yeah, which is, you know, again, it, the book, it 
takes a different look at how race was dealt with in different ways. So, mm-hmm. you know, beginning, she's on the plantation, and that's the typical history that we know right. about slavery. And then she goes to North Carolina, and there's that town where black people are, you know, they can do things just like everybody else. They're not enslaved, and so that's a look at it. And then you go to North Carolina, and that's where there's no black people allowed at all, and they just... Are, they're horrible for everywhere, but he, yeah, it's true. It's a different it's, kind of horrible, right? In, in each place, yes. it's just like some. Some it's kind of like subtly right. pervasive, and others it's pretty overt. So yeah, um, yeah. So and then finally in in Indiana, and then the end of the book I think is a little fuzzy about what is going on. I mean, eventually Ridgeway comes back. He does, yeah. And so <laughs> I had that moment whenever she's escaping from Ridgeway with Royal, and I was like, Homer escaped and they didn't kill Ridgeway, huh? Yeah. Gee, I wonder what could possibly go wrong with this scenario. Right. It's just like, yeah. and that was that was kind of one of my quibbles with the book, is it's just like, I, it's almost fable-like to me, um, the way that the the storyline kind of plays out with this pervasive kind of relentless slave catcher on her tail the entire book and he's following her and and mm-hmm. I just don't know how accurate not killing Ridgeway when you have the chances. Right. That that kind of bugged me, but it's necessary for the plot. Right. So I get it. But unrealistic. Unrealistic. Yeah. I'm just I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think you're just gonna tie that man to that tree and just right. get out of there. Well, that just, doesn't they kill Bozeman though. They do. Yeah, yeah, and that was another thing is that they kill his buddy with the ear necklace, yeah. but they leave the main guy like and I just I don't know. I don't I don't really buy that so much. I mean I guess again are they trying to show that humanity that they're still able to even though this is what people would do to them, they're not going to do it to him. They're they're better in some way. I don't yeah. know. But I still don't think that that's realistic. I uh, Yeah. Because how are you ever going to be safe if you know that he's still going to be out there looking for you? Exactly. And stop. it's like, and Cora knows at that point. Yeah. She knows that Ridgeway's never going to stop. Yeah. But, um, and so, yeah, Ridgeway shows up at this, this new life that Cora's built for herself. She's, she's kind of tentatively exploring a relationship with Royal. She's, she's living life and having a, like, you know, she's actually living for right. once with with still answering to somebody. But, I mean, it's definitely more of a life than she's ever had thus far. Right. Um, and, of course, Ridgeway and Homer come um, and just interrupt this big meeting of everyone in the in the community. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's so frustrating. Because do they, do they lock them in the, in the room? In the, in the Underground Railroad? No, in the, when they're meeting. Oh, yeah. Because they, because suddenly um, Cora realizes that Homer's in the audience, right? Like right. she's not sure. She at, at first she's like, I think I know that kid. Yeah. Which we talked about earlier. How could you really forget this? Like kid? <laughs> I think you remember Homer. He's a little strange. Right. Like of all the people that you've met over this journey, yeah. you'd remember that weird kid. Right. Um. But okay. <laughs> yeah. And so they attack them, and then mm-hmm. everybody. Cora gets away. Cora gets away again. Um, Royal is Royal is shot yeah. and killed, um, yeah. which is a bummer. But at that <laughs> point in the book, I was like, "Of course he is. Of right. course you killed Royal." Like I did like though because you know talking again about her romantic love. So her and Royal, they they have a romantic relationship. She I think loves him more than any other man we've seen in the book. And, right. Um, is is uh, able. He starts like bringing it out of her like the first night that they they have a date and mm-hmm. he takes her to see the underground railroad um, <laughs> super romantic <laughs> right but they, she hadn't seen right. she hadn't seen that station yet right so. so and I don't know I still don't quite understand why they went to go look plot it's right. for plot <laughs> right so they and they they lay down together in bed and he just holds her and yeah. so it's like this beautiful moment but then the next day he's killed right um, but I do like that it's not that story. It's not like, oh, we're going to focus on this love. We're really focused on Cora and her journey throughout the book and her right. journey to, to freedom. So I did. And that's why it wasn't super surprising to me that, that Cora never really gets to have that 
that kind of experience with intimacy with a yeah. romantic relationship because that's not what the story is about. Right. Um, and I think as, if you were trying to explore Cora's uh, <laughs> like personal life, that would take a really long time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, be- because of just the trauma that she's experienced. Yeah. I yeah. mean, as that that would be a whole other like four hundred page book right. if you wanted to start delving into into the psychosomatics of her yeah. her existence. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So so she knows where um the the Underground Railroad stop is near the Indiana train stop. And so it kind of kind of ends up where Ridgeway is with her and chasing he's, her, he's yeah. chasing her down. And so she kind of leads him to the railroad stop and he gets her right at the stairs to the ladder that leads down to it. Yeah. Um, and she kind of knocks him down off of the stairs and he takes a hopefully fatal tumble right. into the railroad stop. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of where we leave Ridgeway at that point. With is, Homer crying beside him, right? With Homer, Homer is like crying beside him. Ridgeway's like, take a note, Homer. And he's, Homer's like, yeah, oh still hanging God. out with him. <laughs> and it's just like, all right, yeah. Homer. And it's just, Homer's just such a tragic character. He really is. And I, I think that that's, that, that scene really stuck with me. Just like Ridgeway dying in a, in a pitch black underground railroad stop that leads to nowhere at this point. Yeah. With his little, his little buddy there next to him. It's just yeah. like, what happens to Homer after that point? Right. And we just kind of leave him. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's tragic. Yeah. He's such a sad character. He is. Um, and then uh, one of my coworkers at East at the Eastside branch, um, she had been listening to it in audiobook, and she was just like, I had to stop listening. She's like, Is Cora okay? <laughs> like, just tell me, just tell me if Cora makes it out alive. <laughs> like, does she make it? Yeah. Um, and we were discussing this a little bit before too. Is that I th- I felt that the ending was ultimately hopeful. I mean, I. But I can see how it could. Right. Other other people could get other readings from it. So I mean, again, we are not spoiler free. So she she makes it to. Somewhere, do we know where she? Uh, I don't know. And honestly, when I was when I was reading it, it felt like she was like on the border of Canada. I don't know if that's accurate or not, yeah. or if I just made that up. <laughs> so it's unclear where she is. Yeah, then... but it, it, you can tell that she's kind of like on the cusp of like getting to somewhere where she feels like she'll be yeah. safe. She's it, headed west. Exactly. Yeah. She's she's getting she's getting to a place where she thinks that she will she will escape finally. Yeah. Um, and so she's kind of on the side of this road and a white couple in a carriage pass her by and they kind of stop and and ask her if she's okay and she just kind of ignores them and they keep going. And then this other older white man kind of passes by and asks if she's okay and she lets him keep going. And then finally, um, an older black man, um, named Ollie comes by in his carriage. Yeah. And she, she accepts a ride from him. Right. And he just says that he's going to St. Louis... St. Louis. See, I don't know yeah. why. I, in my mind, I think she's crossing the border into Canada. And I think that that's just wishful thinking on yeah. my part. I'm just like, she'll escape into yeah. Canada and she'll be safe forever. Um, so, yeah, St. Louis. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense since she was in Indiana. Right. So that's, I think, why it's, she did, she's not in Canada. So she's yeah. not free. So she'll no. still be captured again. Um, that was just so me rewriting. <laughs> rewriting the end of the Lying, book to make myself feel better. Yes. White had to give us a, a nice <laughs> bow. But no, he didn't. Of course. Um... <laughs> But, yeah, overall, I mean, I, I enjoyed the book. I think for me, I, my my best friend and I were reading this together, mm-hmm. and she's white and I'm African American, and so we talked about just how we could not have been friends if we'd been born in that time. Like, you know, yeah. we couldn't. That's not, we would have immediately been at odds, not at odds, but, like, that just wouldn't have even been. Like, with the power imbalance. Yeah. Like, it, it just... It, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, I mean, she would have just been taught to hate me. Right. And that I was less than her, and so we, we just had a really hard time um, talking about that. And then she, I had asked her before I came on here, like, what, what did she get from the book? And she said that just that people are willing to ignore what's going on. Yeah. If that's just, like, the way of the world, then people, even if you know that that's wrong, you still go with it because that's what society's doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and that was one of the big things for me when I was reading it was, I mean, you read about abolitionists and you read about people who helped with the Underground Railroad, but I guess it had just never really sunk in with me just how fraught doing the right thing was. Yeah. I mean, with Ethel and Martin and in the whole book, there are all these people who are, as I said, various degrees of willing mm-hmm. to, to help Cora yeah. um, escape. And it's just, I mean, terrible things happen to 
almost everyone that Cora comes in contact with in this book. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, that was reality. Yeah. I, that that was that was the reality of of doing the right thing, um, was you had to be willing to to put your life on the line. Right. I was trying to find. So when she was in North Carolina, there was a part of the book where they talk about that they would steal bodies to do medical research oh, on yeah. them. Um, and so it's told from the point of this this one med student, and he basically talks about how he doesn't think that he's racist. Or he feels like he's doing the slaves a favor because he says when once they're dead and you look at the bodies, then white people and black people are the same. And he's so, making them equal. Yeah, again. and so that's the, that's when black people become human is in death. And yeah. so that was just, I mean, just horrifying to read and yeah. believe that somebody thought that. And um, yeah, I just that part really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Like I said, um, I don't really plan on rereading this book anytime soon at the very least. Yeah. Um, I do think that everyone should read this book. Yeah. Um, if, if you think you can stomach it. Yeah. Um, I, and even if you don't, because I don't, I don't like violence yeah. really at all. Um, and I, I, I suffered through. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's necessary. Yeah, I it's agree. Good for you. It's not gratuitous violence. It's actually stuff... Maybe not all happened together at one time, but it is things that happen right. to African Americans during slavery. Yeah, um, it's important. And so, if they had to experience it, then we can at least read about it and and know about it and keep you know so that exactly if we know history, we won't repeat it. Exactly. And so, I think that's one of the important reasons to read it. Yeah, I, I abs absolutely agree um yeah um definitely uh give this book a try we've got lots of copies at the lexington public library yes. we've got lucky days we've got large print we've got audiobook as ashley yes. said the audiobook is wonderful mm-hmm. um we would we would definitely recommend checking this one out um oprah oprah said you should yeah. read it so i mean what if oprah says it then <laughs> what are you waiting for <laughs> right. I mean, and it will be adapted i'm certain yes. at, in at any moment into into a tv series i believe is what yeah. they're gonna do first barry jenkins who directed moonlight which is best picture Oh winner um, phenomenal has signed on to direct it right so so at the very least yeah. you can consume it in some form of media <laughs> yes. it's not going anywhere yeah um so thank you so much ashley for joining us today thank you we I really, really appreciate it yeah i loved it it was great to talk about the book great yeah. well thank you guys so much again for listening please don't forget to subscribe and uh, give us a listen and rate us on itunes that really helps us out And please do not forget that we will be having a tie-in program for this podcast. Um, Again, that is going to be on Tuesday, April 18th, 7 p.m. at the Beaumont Branch with Amanda Higgins from the Kentucky Historical Society. And so she's going to be talking about fact and fiction in Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead um, from a perspective of Kentucky women. So thanks again, Ashley. All right. Thanks to you.